Welcome to the Expandable Mind podcast where I speak to creators, entrepreneurs and experts in the field about concepts and topics that not only intrigue me but add a sense of purpose and value to everyday life. I am Vay Narka, your host on the Expandable Mind podcast and in this episode of the podcast I speak to Dr. Tom Crawford where we will speak about embracing fear, finding your passion and how to grow on YouTube. If you don't already know Dr. Crawford, which is very unlikely, well, then here's a little bit of an overview. Dr. Tom Crawford is a mathematician at the University of Oxford, where he holds the position of an early career teaching and outreach fellow at St. Edmund Hall. He also runs the award-winning website associated with social media profiles on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, Tom Rocks Maths. Dr. Crawford received his master's from Oxford University and has completed his PhD in applied mathematics. Dr. Crawford regularly appears on BBC and also has appeared on Numberphile and has also been featured on YouTube's Creator on the Rise for his own YouTube channel, Tom Rocks Maths. Thank you, Dr. Crawford, for being on the Expand Mind podcast. Really appreciate your time. Tell us a little bit about yourself, like, as you... Uh, as you're a mathematician and so forth, like just give us a little bit of background. Of course. So I guess my main role is I teach maths um, at St. Edmund Hall, which is one of the colleges uh, in the University of Oxford. Um, so most of my day job consists of teaching undergraduate maths. Uh, I mainly focus on first years and second years. There's a bit of a joke in the college that I kind of teach everything because uh, whenever they need somebody to teach a particular course, I'm like, yeah, go on, you know, stats, cool, I can do that. Numerical analysis, why not? That'll be interesting for me to learn. And then, you know, I'm like learning it along with the students, different things. So I really do teach pretty much every branch of maths you can think of uh, across the first and second year undergraduate syllabus. Um, and then when I'm not teaching, which is, I absolutely love teaching, should emphasize that, but when I'm not teaching, uh, I guess I'm still teaching because I'm doing YouTube videos and I guess things like this, um, talks in schools, all kinds of stuff, just trying to get my enthusiasm and my excitement about maths um, sort of across to everybody else in the hope that, you know, I'm kind of counting on this idea that if you see somebody else having a great time doing something, it's like in your human nature to want to do that thing. So <laughs> I, I can't help but smile and have fun when I'm doing maths. So the idea with Tom Rock's maths is basically just to record me doing that, document that, and hopefully that will like infect others with my enthusiasm. You have infected me. So your, <laughs> your mission is definitely um, positive and it's really going around uh, very well, uh, if that's, the, if that, that's your MO. Um, yeah. And I don't think any if you if you if your fans have come up to you at the at university or some or something like that then like wait are you Tom Rock's uh, Mads are you, are you like that and they would actually I don't know if you've actually come across this like are you actually a math mathematician um, have you ever come across those questions like is it regular for you, for you? It's not regular no 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 it, it does happen um, it's I never know what to do. I wouldn't say it's awkward. It, it's like, it's really heartwarming, but I never know how to react <laughs> because it's just one of those kind of like awkward human interactions. And I hope that stays because I think, because uh, it, it always catches me by surprise. I'm just like, wait, like in my head, I'm thinking, there's no way this complete stranger actually recognizes me. Like this isn't possible. Uh, and again, I, I hope that continues to to be the way that I think about these things because it, it is it is crazy like all I do is just record myself doing maths and apparently that means you get recognized uh not often but you know from time to time uh, definitely more often in Oxford I guess which makes sense with of course being based here uh but no I've I've, I've was rec I think the most ridiculous one I was recognized on the streets of New York City by like a 14 year old kid who just ran up to me and was like oh my god you're like the guy from number file who talks about fluids <laughs> can i have a photo and i was with my brother at the time and he like he just kind of looked and was like no i'm out and just walked off <laughs> he was just like i'm not dealing with this and just walked away but obviously i i uh had a little chat with the i've forgotten his name because this was like three years ago but we had a little chat and took a photo it was lovely um so no it still surprises me but it, it does happen it's rare but it does happen um, the reason why I asked that is like, 
I, I, the general like archetype or stereotype for a mathematician is like they they come in like trench coats or their suits and with like a little bit of a tie maybe so uh, their attire is like so um formal and so forth and like you see it in like movies and so forth and it's like okay and then you got dr crawford like okay i'm teaching maths i'm i'm literally taking off my clothes while i'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm teaching maths yeah, yeah. And <laughs> you, yeah, a mathematician, like some of the, some of the, some of like the stereotypes is like mathematicians don't have tattoos and so forth. But just like learning about you in like the last few minutes, it just like shows how passionate you're about you, like from the tattoos that you got Navier Stokes uh, tattoos on you. You got the, the hundred, hundred, first 120 digits of um, yes, E my on favorite you. number. Yeah. My favorite irrational number, I should say. Oh, no, no. I have several favorite numbers. Okay, I, I can't even say it's my favorite irrational because my other favorite number is three divided by two to the nine quarters, but I'm pretty sure that's irrational. So, <laughs> so I can't even say E is my favorite irrational, but yes, I have various mathematical tattoos, as you say. If you can expand on that, what, what, what is your inspiration for those tattoos and so forth? I, I personally got one. I got one this year. Um, awesome. What did you get? I'm intrigued Shiv now. Shankar, that's what he's... Um, a lordly name is if i if i can put it like that so i got his trident pull on my back and like the hand coming out from the heart so i got that on my back what what is your inspiration for the tattoos when did what is your first tattoo um so my first tattoo was when i was an undergrad student um but if i'm being honest it's something that's kind of always been in my mind since like you know being a teenager and sort of like getting into rock music and being a bit of an emo kid and you know i used to wear eyeliner i still very occasionally will wear the eyeliner but and, and you know paint my nails and different things uh, but it was even more so it was like every day when i was like a teenager um i used to have my fringe dyed black actually that was the <laughs> that was a look i tell you um so no i think it's always been kind of like the the culture that i've mainly based around music that you know i have like associated with and been involved with always you know live music uh, music in general but in particular live music's always been a big part of like you know what i do with my spare time i'll usually go to a couple of gigs a month to go and see bands and you know and i've traveled around the world to go and see bands and been to festivals all around the world and it's awesome it's like a really good excuse to go somewhere and then also go and see some you know brilliant performances from musicians i really enjoy um so i think just generally around that culture you know tattoos are obviously a big part of of that um, and I think that's kind of stuck with me, um, you know, from that kind of perspective. But then um, in terms of getting the first one, um, I don't know, it just kind of felt right. It's There's no sort of easy way to explain it, perhaps. You know, I was, I think I was, would have been 20. So, you know, I felt like I was old enough. I, you know, I wasn't perhaps um, getting something, not that I'm against anyone getting a tattoo at 18, but, you know, perhaps you could worry, am I mature enough to make this decision? Um, yeah. And things sort of, you know, of that possible um you know could be a way of interpreting things so you know i felt like at 20 i'd done a couple of years at uni sort of got my independence having lived away for two years and different things so i i felt like you know i was mature enough to be able to make that decision and i was like no i still want a tattoo so so i got my first one and then it was quite slow after that actually i think maybe in the next six or seven years i'd maybe have six or seven tattoos possibly ten approximately averaging like one a year or something and then once I actually got, so that was like during my PhD and different things. And then once I actually got a job and realized I have disposable income now, um, I think that was, uh, I perhaps didn't realize that the cost was holding me back. Maybe, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, I don't know. But it sort of aligned that once I had a job and had disposable income, I was like, I'm just going to spend all this on tattoos. So I've been getting a lot more over the last like four or five years. Um, I think I may have just hit 100. Or I'm very close to hitting 100 individual designs. Um, so, and I think like 12 of them, last time I counted on maths, it's really hard to count once you get past a certain number because I have them like, you know, they're on my back, the backs of my legs, like got some on my bum, like they're really easy to count and make sure you're not double counting and not missing ones when you're trying to do it yourself. Um, so maybe I need to, I reckon I need to get like, I don't know, a Sharpie and like literally like tick them off so I can do a proper count of how many maths ones and how many I have in total. But I think it's around a hundred. And I think 12 math scene tattoos. That's, that's amazing. I, I, I'm, I, I'm, well, my philosophy is that I was only going to do one. And that could be a lie, but it could be the truth as well. You never know. Look, I'm, I, I've been like, con I've been wanting to do this tattoo for like three years. I saw it like in a picture. I was like, 
yeah. maybe I can design it. And so I went about designing and so forth. And I was like, okay, I, I want to do this. I'm going to go do it. So um, I got my mom's support. Um, and let's awesome. say- Always nice. My, my parents aren't fans. I think they've just accepted I have tattoos now, but I wouldn't say they're fans. <laughs> Uh, my, I think I, I I was the daredevil. I've always been the daredevil. So if if somebody tells me go bungee jumping tomorrow, I'll probably go do it. I'll be like, you dared me. I'm gonna go do it. Um, and and that's like something that I've I've always been like I live uh, in the present moment, but I also think about the future and so forth. Um, and when when I watch your videos and so forth, just like just for example, your your marathon that you ran from uh, Oxford to Cambridge, which was amazing. Three marathons, three marathons. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> was technically the distance, but yes, the the I guess the official name would be an ultra marathon because if you run anything over a marathon, I think it's just called an ultra or an ultra marathon. But yes, that ridiculous thing that I did last summer. Yeah, I I found it very inspirational. Like on my side, I've always wanted to do um, the an ultra ultra marathon. Uh, unfortunately. Um, I just do my general runs and so forth. I don't do much of like, okay, long distance running. Like the max I've gone up to is maybe Lee, maybe 15, 20 kilometers. And mm -hmm. so when I saw your video, like all about like you running that distance and so forth, what, what is your mindset? What, what, what motivated you? So you ran with your brother and so forth. Like what, what is like, what influenced you to think, okay, let's go actually run that ultra marathon. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so first of all, I enjoy running. Um, so I, I don't do it as much as I used to because I, um, I had a bad knee injury um, playing football. So I played football all my life. I had a bad, bad knee injury about seven or eight years ago. I had to have an operation and was out for like a year on crutches. Um, it's, it's kind of all right now, but it means I have to sometimes um, be careful with the amount of running that I do. Um, but I've always enjoyed it. And I've done three actual marathons, um, proper marathons so far. Not sure I'll do any more. We'll see. Um, but... Um, this idea, it was kind of like a combination of my idea and my brother's idea. So he was, so he runs a lot and he's very, very good. Like his sort of sub three hour marathon time, like 243 or something, his PB. Like he's very, very good. Um, yes. Whereas I'm 311. So I'd like to think I'm still all right, but you know, <laughs> anyhow, so he's really into it. He runs every day. And so um, what we've tended to do over the last kind of 10 years almost now, is we will find somewhere where there's an interesting race happening in like a foreign country or a cool city and then we'll just like go there for the weekend and run the race and obviously use that as an excuse to also visit that place kind of like what i do with like live music and festivals um, and we've done some really interesting ones with like the tel aviv um half marathon a few years ago which was really cool um spending some time in israel we've done um macedonia and skopje skopje we went to the around the marathon there we did the night marathon in bilbao where you run at night which was kind of cool um because usually these things are in the day or very early in the morning which i don't like um so we've kind of done these various things together so like sort of us running together is kind of like a thing um and i'm trying to think how this came about he was discussing he wanted to do some ultras and he was looking at various ones and he found one that was in like Snowdonia running up a mountain in Wales. And I was like, don't do that because I did that marathon and that was bad enough. I was like, you don't want to run even further than a marathon up a mountain. Trust me. Um, and anyway, and then it just kind of like he mentioned an idea of, oh, maybe we should pick two places in the UK and run between them. And then I sort of the more I thought about it, I was like, that's quite a fun challenge to like, you know, travel somewhere on a train. And then like run back home almost like, but doing it over several days. Um, and then given sort of my connections with both Oxford and Cambridge, and of course, you know, that they tend to get lumped together, understandably so, as Oxbridge and everything else. I just thought that would be quite a fun route to do. And then when I saw it was 120 kilometers, 127 kilometers, I was like, you know, three marathons in a weekend it's going to kill me, but it's probably doable. Like I reckon, you know, it's not going to be fast, but I reckon it's, it's achievable. Um, so it just felt right. So that's why we started at Queens college in Cambridge where I was for my PhD. And then I ran to Teddy hall in Oxford, obviously where I am now. So it was kind of like, you know, it was, it was the challenge and the idea of doing the ultra marathon with my brother. But then at the same time, also like the connection between Oxford and Cambridge, I thought was quite nice. And of course it was a really good route. So he, he did an excellent job planning the route. So we avoided main roads. We had one mile where we were on a main road, 
the, the other like 120 whatever we were um on like paths and country lanes and it was really really nice so we did it in the summer to make sure it wasn't raining <laughs> which it didn't it didn't rain fortunately and then we managed to rope in our dad uh to cycle alongside us so he had like the backpack on with like you know all the LucasAid sport and all the Powerade and all the snacks and the sugar that we were stopping and drinking. And so he was like the, the kind of uh, pit crew maybe that you'd call it from like a race uh, supporting us. Uh, but yeah, he found it quite, to be fair to him, you know, he's like in his fifties. So he found it quite tough cycling that distance as well <laughs> with a heavy backpack on because it was uh, mainly full of water and fluid. So it wasn't light, but no, it was great. It was, I wouldn't do it again, <laughs> but I'm glad I did it. It was, it was fun. And then, you know, obviously I figured, well, why not record it? And then I wasn't sure what I was going to do with the footage, but then, you know, once I watched it back uh, about a week or so after I'd finished the run, I thought, I feel like hopefully, you know, the, the YouTube uh, audience might enjoy watching me struggle. So, cause it's obviously not a math video, um, but you know, I, every, I have got one or two non-maths videos on the channel. Obviously, it's predominantly maths, but when I do something silly or something really cool, I think I might, I might just record this and put that up as well. Well, I didn't, I should add, I didn't train very much. And this was, this was a bad idea. Don't recommend this. But I was kind of running maybe the two months beforehand. I was running 10K three times a week. And that was okay. it. Like, I didn't run anything long which was very silly in hindsight um, because because I knew we weren't going that fast. So I was like, as long as I've got a decent enough level of fitness, like I'll just slow down and keep going. And I didn't quite realize, you, you can say that, but when you reach the point where you, you physically almost can't walk, it's kind of, I should have trained more. But, you know, like if, if you are considering doing it, I wouldn't, what I would say is it's tough, but you, you don't need to do as much training as you want. A lot of it was mental to be honest a lot of it was just like mentally kind of like getting through it and just focusing on i'm just going to get to the next 5k and then i can stop and reward myself with like a drink and then i'm going to do the next five and then i'm going to you know and just kind of that was how i dealt with it i just dealt with can i get to the next 5k and then i get a reward which will be i don't know some sweets and some lucas aid and obviously get a bit of a sugar high and then you know it gets you through the first few k of the next set and then i'm like okay just struggle through these next couple and then i get my little sugar hit again and i just kind of broke it down into like manageable pieces um because particularly in day two which is obviously by far the toughest um day one was actually relatively okay in hindsight yeah. but day two was horrendous like you know if i'd woken up and thought you know the start of that day thinking i've got to run 72 kilometers like i just wouldn't have done it i don't think so the fact that i was like i've just got to run five and then i get a break it kind of mentally helped me get through it yeah I, and and i think like well, especially when you talk about like um when you were Okay, let me get through this next 5Ks and so forth. We actually, in a previous podcast episode that I discussed with Tyler Shores, um, uh, we talk about the virtual carrots and stick model, and that's actually like the perfect application about it. And yeah. I can I can think about it like in the last week that I ran, I ran a very steep mount, mountain in my area. So I live in a valley and running up these steep uh, mountains and so forth. I was like, next light pole, and maybe I'll stop there. And then it's like, you get this run as high and I, yeah. I just kept on going up the hill it's like okay i'm gonna do it i'm gonna get there i'm gonna carry on getting there come on and then okay i to be fair and honest it's well i got like to the second light second last light light pole before the top of the mountain i was like okay i have to walk and <laughs> I, and I didn't have a choice. I was like, my calves are burning, my th yeah. my quads are burning, everything is burning w in me. So I, I think I'm going to take it. I'm going to take this break. Um, and when I got to the top, I was like, I did it. But now I need to improve. I, I need to get it up here one go. Um, <laughs> and there's always that room for improvement. But I, I think yeah, I think watching your video was the ultimate in inspiration for my like kind of my running journey. My dad runs and so forth. But it was your video that like, just like, okay, I'm, I'm going to go do this year. Uh, I'm really not going to care what anybody else thinks. And yeah. th this, this, and that brings me on to like talking about self-confidence. You have like an extremely high amount of it. You're like, uh, I don't know if this is true and maybe you can like expand on it. Just like you you as a person like really don't care what anybody else thinks when you in those maths videos you you are thoroughly passionate like I, I can i can hardly ever see you like oh I, i'm doing this you are so passionate and in in the moment like 
what what drives you like what where does that where does that boost come up for you like what what is your thinking line like, just give us some of that boost mm -hmm. to good thing um okay so i think it's important to say that the very first video i ever made which you obviously is still on my youtube channel i know lots of youtubers delete their old videos because they can't watch them i cannot watch this because it is terrible but i i'm not very good on camera like it's it's a bit awkward um i kind of stumble through my words i think watching that back i think what you've said is kind of a good way to think about it i think i'm too conscious of the fact that i'm being filmed and i'm sort of like you know thinking oh people might be watching this and so it's i think it is important to say that that is how everybody starts off when they're like you know filming themselves um i don't know anyone that i've spoken to who also makes youtube videos who you know who immediately got on camera and was like this is all fine you know like it doesn't work like that it's okay. always awkward at first um but you get used to it in the sense of um for example like another thing i do a lot of like public speaking so for lots of people that's kind of perhaps the thing they can relate to in the sense of they're doing um public speaking you know lots of people really don't enjoy public speaking they find it terrifying so i think you know that's kind of where i was at with my first youtube video it was awkward it was i was a little bit like worried or scared just like anyone is the first time they sort of speak in public but then the more you do the more you get used to it and the more comfortable you start to feel um so i think i was perhaps had a slight advantage in the sense that i already had a lot of public speaking experience so um, I think that certainly helps. I was used to talking in front of an audience. So even though for the YouTube videos, obviously I'm just talking to a camera, but you know, it kind of, I don't know. I think it helped me get better um, more quickly, get better quicker basically because I had the experience of public speaking. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, kind of like where I'm at now and different things, I don't know, I think, it's it's a lot easier once you've kind of put something out there and received positive feedback. So obviously you don't not, you know, as with anything on the internet, not everyone is going to like it. Um, and you obviously need some level of resilience to be aware of that and be able to deal with the people who don't like it. Um, so I know some people just ignore the comment, just don't read their comments, for example, because they just don't want to see any potential negativity. And that's obviously one way to deal with it. Um, you know, I read all my comments. I will generally reply to the majority of them, or at least I try to. It's beginning to become more and more difficult because there's more of them, which is awesome, but it's really hard to reply to them all because I want to reply to them all. Um, but so you do need some resilience to be able to deal with the negative ones. But I think one way I find that that's helpful in that sense is to focus on, you know, it's like going to be a couple of negative ones versus overwhelming positive ones. So, you know, it's, again, it's easier said than done, but you kind of put it into the perspective of, and again, this is probably where it helps being a mathematician, right? Just because there's one negative one and say there's like 40 positive ones, that's a tiny, tiny fraction. So that's fine. I don't care about that. But, you know, I can, again, I think being a mathematician helps me to perhaps reason in that way. Whereas perhaps people who aren't mathematically minded often will focus on that one negative one and, you know, and then sort of, can that you know, can like harm their confidence a little bit so i think i think sort of genuinely like the way my brain works being a mathematician actually helps in in, in the sense of seeing this is generally overwhelmingly positive and then that gives you more confidence to think well i'll just keep putting material out there because you know you're getting positive feedback um but no it, but at the start it was certainly um you know trickier and and it was awkward to begin with but as with all things, you just have to keep going with it. And then you, you learn what to do. You, it becomes more natural. You become more comfortable with it. Um, and then it sort of doesn't feel as awkward and feels more like a normal thing for you to do. Um, so I think that's sort of perhaps how I've, how I've dealt with it in, in, in that sense, in terms of like putting material out there. Yeah. And, and that sounds really, really amazing. And when we speak about passion and so forth, like, your passion towards mathematics is damn when you when you look at your youtube videos and how you explain things uh, the levels you you'd go to from just making an audience letting an audience understand what you're trying to say 
how did your mathematics journey begin? Was it when you were in high school or was it like as a young child where you're a protege? Like, okay, I can do this like from a very young age. Did you always notice that? Or was it like somebody that was in the math- mathematics field that in- encouraged you? Um, well, first of all, I don't, I definitely wasn't any kind of like child prodigy or child genius or anything on, on that aspect. I was just someone who enjoyed learning and worked hard. That That is honestly the, the way I see it. Um, like I'm, I wouldn't say, I don't think skeptical is the right word, but I'm very, I think with a lot of these things, you know, you, you sort of, some people get this, this idea that in order to like, succeed and say you know teach maths in in oxford you have to have become so you know you have to have been like a child genius and and it really couldn't be further from the truth right just it's all about you you need a really strong work ethic and it's all actually about how you develop beyond that because even if you are let's say a child genius if you don't put any work in and you just kind of live off that then you you don't really progress anywhere Right. So like different people progress at different rates and you, and you, you know, the maths you do at school is very different to the maths you do at university is even more different when you go into research. So there's like, you, you can struggle through maths all the way to research and then suddenly just something clicks and you can be an excellent researcher, perhaps having not got the best degree. Like, and I know researchers like that who, you know, when, you know, got average marks in their degree, but are like fantastic researchers just because, you know, their degree requires them to cover all different areas of maths. Whereas when you're doing research, you just focus on your absolute niche. And if you are amazing at that niche, that's all that matters. Um, But in terms of me and sort of um, where I got to, you know, where I am and different things, like I've always enjoyed maths. So I think the fact that I've enjoyed it and the fact that in all of my schoolwork and all of my studies throughout my life, I've always worked hard. I think those combinations, like I'm willing to put the hard work in and I enjoy doing it just kind of means I'm going to happily spend hours upon hours practicing and learning and reading and doing problems and doing past exams. And as with any skill, that means you become good at it. Um, So, you know, it certainly helps that my brain clearly works in a certain way that is aligned with how maths is taught and how maths works like like you know there is a certainly an aspect of that just as some people have musical talent and different things but just as probably anyone within reason can learn the guitar again anyone within reason can learn maths and can become good at maths you've just got to put in some people have to put in more hours than others but you can still um get to a very very high level of course to reach the absolute like pinnacle like you know being like a concert pianist that's only available to select few. So, you know, being like a research mathematician, sure, that is potentially only available to certain people. But again, it doesn't, they don't have to have been brilliant all their life, but obviously they do need to be brilliant at some point to reach that kind of, you know, research university level mathematician. But it is, again, I just, I do want to stress that, you know, I just worked hard and, you know, was good at maths and enjoyed it. Like I wasn't in any way like some kind of child genius or or anything of that nature. I just, as I say, yeah, I, it was fun. I I was, you know, I was always in top set and different things and would sort of push myself to try and get the highest marks in the class and, and different things, you know, and wanted to get the highest marks in my A-levels and GCSEs and all my qualifications. Um, but, you know, a lot of it just came from actually um, being willing to put in the hard work. And speaking about your GCSEs and your A-levels, I'm currently in my A-levels. So maybe you can give me advice as well as the audience. The audience that is listening, probably, they're probably also doing the uh, A-levels or IB, IB exams or whatever exams they are doing at final levels. Uh, you, got, you did 10 GCSE subjects. Bravo to you. I, I literally salute you there. And you got 10 A-stars um, and... That's amazing. Um, I, I, as one, only did seven GCSEs. So, and I got my six uh, A's, um, three A stars and three A's, um, which, and one B. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well done. Well, awesome. then thank you so much. Um, the one B, obviously, is my second language. So I'll be very honest. It was, second language was not ever my favorite. It was like a, I have to go to the subject and I always used to dread it. I used to always want to like, okay, can I swap the subject out for maybe maybe a little bit more time in maths or maybe a little bit more time in comm science 
or uh, give me more bio to do or something like that. And unfortunately, I used to never get get that opportunity. Um, and when you got to A levels, you also rock, rocked it out of the park, um, and you got five A grades. What what is your what were your subjects that you took in GCSE if you can remember, and what are your subjects that, that you took in A levels? Oof, GCSEs, that's going to test the memory. Okay, so first of all, the, the, the 10 is was, at least at my school, was standard. Everyone basically did 10 GCSEs. Um, so I did I did double science. So we, we studied like chemistry, physics, biology, all separate. But it was like it counted as two GCSEs. I don't know quite how that worked, but that's, that's how it did. So I got two in science, um, obviously maths, English language, and English literature. So like double in English. Uh, which again, they were all standard. You had no choice on those. And then we all had to do religious uh, studies as well. So they were the six compulsory ones. And then you got four options. So I picked French, geography, history, and business studies. So they were, um, I don't think computer science existed. Definitely not at my school um, as an option then. Otherwise I possibly maybe would have done that. Um, but obviously business studies was the rogue one. I think I threw that in because all of the other subjects were quite standard. So I'd been obviously been studying French for a few years beforehand and geography and history were compulsory up to that point. Um, and I'd enjoyed them all. Um, and I, th I think I just kind of got a bit excited and thought I want to study something new for GCSE. Um, so that's kind of where the, I think where the business studies idea, but it was good. It was, it was interesting for sure. Um, so, and then a level, um, so we had to do um, an A-level in critical thinking. That was another compulsory uh, one at the school. Um, so that was one of them. And in terms of my choices, I picked obviously maths, further maths, chemistry, and then geography. Because I loved it so much at um, GCSE that I wanted to continue uh, doing geography. And the best, I think, the funniest thing about this story is my best A-level mark was geography. Of all four, of all five subjects. So even though I'm now a mathematician and I teach maths, uh, obviously my maths marks were very good, right? But like my best mark was geography. I, I think like especially when when we your geography knowledge, uh, I don't think it, it, it didn't go to waste at all. Especially since your your PhD thesis, thesis had to do with um, if, I, if you can obviously correct me, uh, the dispersion of water from a river, river mouth, if maybe I'm wording it incorrectly that the mathematics around it, so. No, no, that's pretty much it, yeah. When, imagine a river flowing into the ocean, river water gets to the river mouth, and it's like, where's it gonna go? It's pretty much, you know, I think the easiest way to visualize it is imagine the river was dyed green, and then you've got this like flow of green water into the ocean, where would the green end up, right? That's just the easiest way to think about it. So yes, no, I think you're right. I think perhaps maybe subconsciously, I don't know, the, the geography that I'd been doing up to the age of 18 kind of snuck back in with my interest in fluid mechanics because, you know, studying the climate, the atmosphere, oceans, rivers, fluids, it's all very, very closely related to a lot of the stuff you would do in geography, definitely. Yeah, uh, and and this talking about that, I, I as, a, as an academic, I've always been an academic, and, and this comes back to, you play football. You're a big fan of it, um, and to I'm going to be totally honest. I can't play football. Um, I got two left feet, so I, I'd, I'd observe. I'd sit at far, and I would probably just watch somebody play. Although definitely not my forte, as I would probably score the goal for the opposite team. Uh, if 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 you can define it that as how bad I am at soccer <laughs> or football, uh, and and this. Thinking about that, how did you balance? Because you always you you enjoy playing football. How did you balance your academic life and your your social life or your personal life? How did you balance it? No, no, no that's a good question, and and I still do it now. So even now, I still play football um, at least once a week, sometimes twice a week. So I'm currently playing for two teams. I think yeah, a couple of years ago, the the year pre COVID. 2019 i was playing for three teams actually in a week that was maybe a bit much playing three 90 minute matches a week that was quite tricky to fit all my teaching around uh, but now no no at the moment i am playing for two teams um, and i tend to fit it in so it's just about for me it's i don't think it's necessarily prioritizing things but it's obviously realizing that i want to do these things so how can i fit them in with everything else that i need to do 
So it's kind of, and it was similar when I was like a student, to be honest. It was, you know, being an undergrad, I was playing football again when I was here as a student, um, continuing now, obviously, as a staff member. Um, and, you know, we'd play, the matches were pretty consistent. They'd be, I think they were Thursdays. I think they were Thursdays when I was an undergrad, I forget. Um, and so I just knew that, you um, if I had any deadlines on, let's say, a Thursday night or a Friday, then I'd probably have to finish that work earlier in the week because I knew I was going to be playing football on a Thursday. So it was just kind of like planning ahead in that sense of, you know, realizing that, you know, maybe I wanted to go to the pub with my mates on Wednesday night, but actually Wednesday was when I needed to finish my maths and get it in before football because I knew, you know, I'd be taking the whole afternoon off to go and play football. Um, So I think I've always been quite good at organizing my time in that sense of realizing you know this is something I want to do fitting it in and then making sure I can still do everything else I need to do around around that um if from what what the sounds of it you mastered the art of prioritizing from an early age um especially like your GCSEs and your A levels like um I as I as a uh, as a person, I'm always uh, believing that, yes, we all like, live at, at some potential of making some fault. And sometimes, yeah, we we tend to prioritize the wrong things. Um, I, 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 for example, I can spend hours on end at, on Twitter just looking at <laughs> people's uh, random tweets, o- open academic or in anything and i'm like just have like good chuckle at anything all the memes and so forth dr memeing and so forth and yeah i just would like to know like what what can you like advice could you give an audience like somebody like me that just has this um we sometimes go off the bandwagon and we like prioritize the wrong thing what 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 like sort of frame question can we like influence ourselves to actually like okay let's let's prioritize something that's actually demands us of more work and so more attention yeah well i don't think it's about prioritizing work necessarily it's about i think sometimes it's about realizing that there are things that you enjoy and want to do so you know there's nothing wrong with enjoying scrolling twitter right like if that keeps you entertained and makes you laugh then i don't see you know there is nothing wrong with that it only becomes an issue when you do that when you should be doing other things so i think one way that you can kind of deal with that is to actually allow yourself to have that time. So rather than seeing it as like a negative of, I am not allowed to aimlessly scroll Twitter, just be like, okay, so I'm allowed to aimlessly scroll Twitter as soon as I finish my homework. Or, you know, turn it into like the carrot on the stick thing like we were talking about before. Or even just say, you know, I'm gonna maybe, the hour before I fall asleep is going to be my scrolling through Twitter time or something like that. So like, I I really like cartoons. I watched so many cartoons, (laughs) like far too many. I'm currently rewatching uh, the last season of South Park ahead of the new one coming out. And I'm very excited about that. Um, and so I like, because obviously I have lots of things that I have to do and, and that I enjoy doing, but I want to watch cartoons. So for me, the last 30 minutes before I go to sleep every day, I stick a cartoon on. So I know throughout the day, no matter how busy I am, the last 30 minutes of that day will be spent with me drifting off to sleep, watching a cartoon in bed. And so it kind of fulfills that fact that I want to watch a cartoon it's obviously not essential. It's not productive in like a work sense, but it's something I enjoy doing. And I know that, you know, that 30 minutes will always be there at the end of the day when I can just chill out and watch a cartoon. Um, so I think like allowing yourself to have time to do some of these things is, is a good way to do it. And then something else that I found really helpful, um, particularly as an undergraduate student or like even an A-level student was um, sort of thinking longer term. So for example, when I was an undergrad, we, um, at Oxford, so you have your exams every year when you're doing your maths degree and they're always in the third term. So you have, you do your work and your tutorials, lectures, first term, second term. Sometimes you'll have a little bit at the beginning of the third term and then you usually get four or five weeks break. Well, I say break when you're revising and then you have your exams at the end of the year and it's on everything you've learned that year. So my approach to this was, I'm going to obviously do my work in the first two terms and I'm going to enjoy my Christmas vacation and my Easter vacation between those two terms. Um, But, you know, as long as I've got my work done, I don't need to worry about trying to study for my exams in those first two terms. But, as you know, so that's when you can sort of have, I could have fun. I could go to the pub, do whatever I wanted to do, play even more football. But then once it got to the third term, 
I had sort of like promised myself, right, I'm just actually just going to do work this whole time. So for every year I was here, like those eight weeks were literally, I'd just be in the library for 12 hours a day because I just accepted that by doing this, this is what has allowed me to enjoy the other two terms. And this is what allowed me to have fun and what allowed me to enjoy my vacations. And, you know, I'd usually have some like fun summer plans lined up and different things. And I would just accept that I'm going to just have to spend these eight weeks it's not going to be the most fun experience, but it's like I saw it as essential to to make sure I was going to get the degree that I wanted. And I just accepted it's only eight weeks. I can do that. And then I can enjoy the other 44 weeks of the year with complete freedom. So like sort of thinking in that sense, sort of like thinking longer term is, is sort of uh, perhaps how I would describe that kind of mindset. And I found that for me worked really, really well as a student. How did you actually like know that academ- academia was your part? Were, were your parents academics as well? Did they like encourage you in that way or was it just? No, exact opposite. Well, I wouldn't say exact opposite. My, neither of my parents went to university. Um, so as, as far as I'm aware, I think I'm the first person in my family that went to university. None of the grandparents or, or cousins or anything, aunties or uncles, don't think any of them went to university. Um, so like, like for me, it just felt like, the, you know, there wasn't, ever a question of am I going to go to university it was just I am enjoying studying I you know have worked hard at it and you know was doing well and getting good exam grades so it was just okay I'm just going to keep studying and I get to go to university to continue to do that it was just kind of like you know it was never really a discussion that needed to be had it was just I'm enjoying this I'm obviously just going to do maths because it's fun and I'm just going to go to university and do maths like it wasn't kind of any discussion around that Um, and then when I was doing my undergrad, um, I'd never heard of uh, a PhD, uh, until about my third year. And I don't quite know how it came up in conversation, but it came up, I was talking to somebody and it came up and I was like, what on earth's a PhD? And then, you know, when I discovered it's basically continue doing your subject for another four to five years and this time get paid. I was like, wait, what? I I can, I can continue studying and learning about maths and I'm going to get paid paid like this this cannot possibly be a real thing um so then once i discovered that was a real thing it wasn't a joke i was like well obviously i'm doing this um you know so like so then i just went on and did that you know obviously again was fortunate enough that i had worked hard enough and and different things and got good enough grades to be able to do that you know i'm aware obviously being in that position to be able to have that choice but you know for me it was an easy choice it was like well obviously i'm just gonna keep studying forever this is amazing um then so it's interesting you refer to uh sort of me working in academia and i guess because i'm employed by you know st Edmund hall which is part of the university then i guess technically i'm i am an academic but i definitely am not in the traditional sense because i don't actually do research so even though i'm i'm my official position i'm an early career fellow at teddy hall same as anyone else who is doing research except i'm an early career fellow in mathematics for teaching and outreach whereas normally you would be an early career fellow in your subject for uh in teaching and research or perhaps just in research so because i'm teaching and outreach basically i i do the the tutorials with my students i do the teaching aspect but then Um, the outreach part, which would normally be the research part, basically that's what allows me to do the YouTube videos, to do the school talks, to do all the stuff that I also really, really enjoy. Um, So it was pretty awesome of um, Snedman Hall to actually, you know, allow me to do this um, and like, you know, make it part of my job. Um, And it's a very, very, very non-standard academic position. I'm not sure, I've never met anyone else who does the same thing. I'm sure there probably is, but I've never met anyone else who who has the same position where it's just focusing on teaching, sorry, where it's a focus on teaching and outreach without any necessity to do research. Because I think at least the way I think about academia is continuing to do research. Um, But for me, as much as I enjoyed my PhD project, and and I genuinely did, like, you know, I got to do field work, I got to sail around the Southern Ocean, which was awesome, around Antarctica. I got to do experiments. I got to, you know, sit and do maths, solve some equations. I got to do, you know, all of these amazing things around this project and loved it. But I kind of felt like I needed more variety in what I was doing. 
And that's one thing that research, I don't think anyway, really allows for. Because the idea is, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, you become like the world expert in your niche. So I'm probably not now, but when I published my thesis, I was quite possibly the world expert in buoyant outflows in rotating environments, to give it its technical title. Because I had just spent four years studying that exact problem and writing a short book, 255 pages, all about it. But... You know, I didn't want to continue to be the world expert on buoyant outflows in rotating environments. I wanted to go off and, I don't know, study something entirely different. And so I found that, at least from the the impression I got, was that lots of research, you, you did sort of go into this kind of niche. You know, there was an opportunity maybe later in your career to branch out a little bit, but almost like, but you to get to that position, you had to have kind of, you know built up enough of a research portfolio and obviously having just spent four years on one thing means you're going to concentrate on publishing as much as you can around that topic and I kind of wanted to do something different Um, and that's kind of what led me almost by accident into teaching and into uh, making YouTube videos and stuff because you know like I've been recording two videos today and it was a case of like sitting down this morning and being like right I'm filming some stuff today what am I going to do? And it was just like, okay, cool. Let's just think about some cool math problems. And then, you know, oh yeah, that one's interesting. Okay, right. Let's write a script. Let's film a video about it. So like, you know, I I woke up just sort of having, knowing I was filming, but not knowing what I was going to be doing. And I enjoy that. So I just kind of scrolled some stuff on the internet, found some interesting problems, interesting topic. And then, you know, spent four hours thinking about it and recording a video about it. And that kind of variety. And I'll, you know, I'm, I'm teaching tomorrow, but later this week when I'm filming another video, I'll do the exact same thing. So it's just whatever I takes my interest that particular day, I'll make a video about. And I really, really enjoy that freedom. And when you're talking about making videos, just by, just by you speaking about scripting, how long does it take you to script uh, a video? That varies a lot depending on the video, um, depending on the content. So I... I don't know how, I don't know what the norm is when it comes to um, recording YouTube videos, but my, I'll tell you through my process. So my process is, as I said, I, I find an interesting topic and I have a list on my phone of like cool stuff or cool problems. So I'll sometimes, you know, I'll scroll through that and something jumps out on me and I'll think, oh yeah, I remember this thing I was reading about last week. Yeah, let's do that. Um, or, you know, or if I, you know, nothing on the list jumps out at me, then I'll find something else on the internet, you know, endless source of things on the internet. Um, and then, or sometimes actually ideas come from my students. I'll think, oh yeah, I was doing this tutorial in quantum last week. And then we had this really interesting discussion about wave functions. That would that'd make a good video or whatever it is. And then I'll just sit down and I'll just sort of like start typing, usually just in a Word doc. Um, and, you know, maybe 30 minutes, an hour later, I've just typed out like my thoughts about, you know, I'm, I'm sort of typing it as though it's a script. I'm typing as though I'm speaking out loud rather than, you know, typing for a written article. But I'm just literally just typing just, you know, without giving, you know, there's no like editing or, or double checking or anything. I'm just kind of writing just whatever comes out. Um, and then that's it. So then that's like my script in the sense of I've just spent an hour, maybe a bit longer if it's a complicated topic, thinking about the problem, writing everything down. And then I basically shut my laptop and turn the camera on and go. So I don't have a script. Um, like, you know, I've, I've thought about it enough to form for the idea to become coherent and for the order and, you know, the examples to solidify in my head. But I'm not at any point for any of my videos reading from a script. Unless it's, you know, like a paragraph where I have to say thank you to so-and-so for sponsoring or whatever, right? Obviously, you have to script those bits. But when it's me doing maths, it's quite literally me just freestyling, like, okay, cool, I've just thought about this for a bit. This is the problem. Let's go. Um, Because I think that's like how I teach. And so I think in order to be natural, and the idea of these videos are generally to teach people, I want to present them as though I am teaching them. So that's exactly how I teach when I'm teaching students. I've spent, you know, hour, a couple of hours, whatever, doing the problems myself, thinking about the problems. Then I've marked their work and then we sit down and then we talk through them and go through them. So again, I'm not following a script, but I've thought about them enough that I know what's going on. And so that's kind of how I try and do my YouTube videos. So, so when you first started, and this may be one of your first few videos, um, was there ever, ever fear like of, okay, 
I might mess up here, I might mess up here. They, and like, especially like from my experience, just doing this podcast and uh, speaking to distinguished people like yourself and people who um, I admire and uh, I'm, I'm inspired by. Um, like I always have this fear, like, oh, hey, if I say this one wrong word, I'm like, I'm a fool. Um, and, and, and it often comes up to me and it's like, okay, um, say this word and there are repercussions. You will be a fool on the internet. And I'm like, okay, how did you, how did you actually overcome that? Like, is there a way to overcome it? Um, did you ever make a mistake? And what, what, what is... Oh God, so loads, yeah. There's, there's a classic one where I, I think I'm describing commutativity. So A times B equals B times A. And I call it associativity, I think, which is a different one. It's very similar, but it is different. Um, there's there's like a couple of, there's just things like that where it happens. I mean, I think the best way um, to deal with these things is you, you can't focus on them and you can't be too worried. So obviously you don't want to go into a video knowing nothing about the topic because then you're just going to make mistakes all day and then it's of no use to anybody. Right. But, you know, I'm talking about maths, which I have been studying my entire life um, and it has been the sole focus of my studies for the last 14 years. So I spent the last 14 years pretty much every day thinking about and solving maths problems. So I'm like, I'm relatively confident that I can do. I know I know what maths is. I know how to do it. But, you know, like, and I make these mistakes when I'm teaching. Like there was one yesterday. It was a really, really simple one. But like um, I was writing out the general uh, form of a second order linear differential equation. Um, so where you have a times second derivative plus b times the f first derivative plus c times y equals some function. And I forgot, so I wrote it as a times y double prime plus b y prime plus c equals zero. So I just forgot to write the y. And like, I know I asked my students, how do you solve this? And they just looked really puzzled at first. Like, I'd be like, wait, what's going on? And then eventually one of them says, is there meant to be a y next to c? And I was like, oh yeah, sorry, of course there is. And obviously then they like... So it just, it's just human nature, right? It, it doesn't mean that you don't understand, you know, and different things. It's just, it happens. So I think being, able, being willing to accept that is really important, right? Um, also, you know, um, if, if you worry too much about it, you'll never get started. You'll never do anything if you worry about making these kinds of mistakes. Um, and something else that I um, have found very helpful um when doing any form of science communication in general actually is you obviously have to treat it different to like talking to an academic audience so if i'm like presenting an academic paper or i'm presenting you know when i was a phd student a talk on my actual phd work to a room of academics like i'm making sure that almost every phrase i say is very correct and if i state a theorem i'm stating all possible conditions you know i'm saying for any closed compact domain with continuous boundary blah 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 i'm reading you know you're being very precise because that's what you need to do when you're presenting a mathematical argument but when i'm doing a youtube video trying to just get people excited about a particular topic i'm not going to cover every single possible alternative case and i'm not going to because then i just spend 90 percent of the video listing all of the exceptions and all of the rules and that becomes boring that then goes against the idea of trying to generate that enthusiasm in people so i think a good way that i like to think about what i'm doing in my videos is i'm giving you i'm hopefully not telling you anything that's wrong but i'm giving you enough information like almost like the minimum level to be able to follow what the idea is and what the concept is if you want to know about the very specific technical details then look this topic up in a textbook is kind of how I would say it, right? Like it's, I think, and I think it's the same when you're lecturing at university, you, you cannot spend your one hour lecture going through every single possible case and listing all conditions when such a theorem holds. You just say, you know, provided our functions are sufficiently nice, we all know what that means, then this holds. And then, you know, it's kind of the student's job to figure out exactly what all of those conditions are because otherwise you just, you just don't get anywhere. Um, you know, in that sort of short amount of time you have to convey the, the important bits of the information. Yeah, and and that, that actually brings on one of the audience members uh, asked on Twitter, "What advice does 
Uh, what advice do you have for someone who is terrified of failure and then actually fails at something? Of what, what do you recommend? How do you actually deal with a scenario like that? First of all, failure is good, right? That's not an original statement. <laughs> Anybody ever, right, who has been successful. It's, it's the classic case, isn't it, of all the entrepreneurs who are billionaires who are like, I failed 400 times and then eventually I had success, right? Like, So, you know, but I joke, but it is important, right? You're not going to succeed at everything you try and do and you're definitely not going to succeed at everything first time. Like you learn from failure. That's the important thing. You learn about what didn't work or what went wrong and then you just like that's the idea you just have to take a lesson from from that failure if if you're genuinely very scared of it um then i think you can start with small things so so i I did actually see this question um yesterday on on twitter and i was thinking about it and i was like i wonder whether like when i say small things even if it's just something like i don't know playing a video game and losing right like i've definitely played so so i don't play as much video games as i would like because um that does take up a lot of time that i don't have but i i have definitely played video games in the past with with people who are almost like terrified of like you know being killed or like failing on a level or something like and they just so much so that they just kind of like don't enjoy playing it and they don't want to play it because they might not complete the level and i don't know for me that's like maybe it's because perhaps I'm sort of have a, a different mindset and, and more accustomed to it. But like, I'm just like, it's part of the fun. Like you want to get to something where you, you know, again, if you sort of try and take like a video game level and think about it in real life, like if you're playing a video game, you get so much more enjoyment when you get to a bit that's really, really difficult. And you know, okay, you don't want to spend like 48 hours trying to do it. But you know, if it takes you like an hour to get past a certain point or something, you're like, yes done it you know it's like the reward is just like so nice when you finally overcome that thing you were really struggling and i think like in life it's kind of the same right so maybe to train yourself to be better at accepting failure perhaps trying something very very simple like playing video games or maybe like i don't know trying to bake a cake if you've never baked a cake be like right i'm gonna try and make an apple cake or whatever, or an apple tart. It's going to be terrible if you've never cooked one before and, you know, and you can fail at it. And then, you know, you can then try again and improve and sort of start with perhaps things that feel like they are less significant than, you know, failing an exam or whatever that other, you know, big thing may be. And perhaps you can kind of train yourself through those, you know, insignificant things to get used to this idea of you're going to fail, but then you learn from it and then you succeed afterwards and then that success is even more rewarding what is your biggest failure yeah uh, now that's a really difficult question because i'm generally a very very positive person very optimistic person and have a very positive mindset and i think i imagine that probably comes across in my videos right like it's not an act i'm just generally like you know very grateful to just like be alive and be doing cool things and just kind of for me i and again i'm aware obviously this is not true for everybody, but for me, it's very easy to just see the positives of any situation. And that's kind of what I always try and focus on. Um, so I I honestly don't think I have anything that immediately jumps out at me as, as a failure. I, I really don't. Um, there are certainly like, you know, I have applied for jobs and internships and things in the past that I haven't got. I don't know whether you'd call those failures. Um, you know, as, as, um, one example, um, so when I um, was moving, actually, bef- let me think that would be a better example. Okay, so when I finished my PhD and then I spent a year working at the BBC um, in science communication, and that's kind of how I got into eventually making YouTube videos. Now, after doing that for a year, um, I missed doing maths. And so I applied for a few different positions one of them was to go and be a lecturer at St. Hugh's in Oxford, which is the job I ended up taking. And, you know, the rest is history. Brought me back to Oxford and then I'm now fellow at Teddy Hall. Now, when I was applying for jobs, um, I was applying for another job for a sort of um, an education startup company. Uh, and it was basically going to be to help them write their online maths course. And I thought this sounded amazing. Like, you know, this kind of idea of 
creating an online platform that was tailored to a student and I was going to like be in charge of writing this entire platform of interactive maths activities and basically designing what do students need to know to be good at A-level maths. Um, and I was really excited about it and I got all the way through to having various interviews with like the CEO and various things, but I ended up not getting the job. Now, I guess to some people that would understandably, you could call that a failure because it was like a job I wanted and obviously worked hard to prepare for the interviews and, and various things, but then didn't, wasn't given the position. But like a week later, I then applied for the um, position at St. Hughes and then got the job there and then moved back to Oxford. And then now I'm in my literal dream job of teaching and making YouTube videos. And I often wonder, you know, would that have happened if I had instead been offered this job with this education startup? Like, because I was almost, you know, thinking, because I had so many interviews and got so far, I was almost thinking like this was a sure thing kind of vibe. I was like, they're going to give me this job and it's going to be awesome. Like, And I'd sort of, you know, planning to move to London and all kinds. And then it kind of like fell through. But you know, it it then actually led me back to Oxford and that obviously then led me to where I am today. So, you know, whether you'd call that a failure, I honestly don't know. I, I find, um, you know, it was something that I went for. It didn't work out. But ultimately, I think long term, it made me, you know, get to where I am. And genuinely, I couldn't think of anything I'd be rather doing than, than what I do for my job at the moment. So, and, and, and that like, when I look at your, your story and so forth, uh, you being an out, uh, going, uh, go, being an outreach fellow and so forth, what was, um, what, how, how did that, how did that, how did you go from working at the BBC to o Oxford again? Was it like your plan? Was it all is okay. I want to go back to Ox Oxford. Or was well, as, as I was just mentioning then, like, you know, I, I was just looking for other jobs Like you know, I've been doing the BBC thing for a year um, and I felt like that was sort of long enough. Um, and I also, to be honest, the main thing for me actually was I'd started um, the, the YouTube channel and started doing Tom Rock's maths because I had sort of been well trained in communication. And I think that alongside the fact that I'd already done lots of teaching as a graduate student, um, sort of just led me to think, well, in order to best explain maths, I think you need visuals. It's very difficult to do that because I was working on a radio show at the BBC. And so I thought that visuals would help. And so I kind of used all the the training and things that I'd picked up from that job to, to then think, right, I'm going to start making YouTube videos. Um, and that was mainly just as a means to, again, sort of get across my enthusiasm and, and passion for maths to as many people as possible, really and be able to like explain it um, so that, you know, as many people as possible could understand some complicated ideas. Because that was mainly, again, that was what the radio show was about that I was working on at the BBC. Um, so I wanted something that would allow me to still work on the, um, the YouTube channel and make videos, whilst obviously also needing to have a job that would actually pay the rent kind of vibe. So um, the various things I was looking at were I wouldn't say they were part time, but they had like flexible working patterns. So again, this um, startup company would have been like four days a week and flexible working and various other things. You know, some of it can be done from home. So there was like, you know, I was purposefully looking for something that had that flexibility to allow me to spend time doing um, working on Tom Rock's maths and you know being able to do talks in schools because I'd started doing talks in schools and of course they happen on Monday to Friday, so you have a full time job. It doesn't really work. Um, so there was those kinds of things as well. Um, so kind of putting all that together, it just ended up, as I said, I saw this position at St. Hughes. Um, you know, I came over to Oxford and had an interview. Fortunately, they liked me, they offered me the job. Um, so I just did that for a couple of years. Um, and then I sort of reached a point where um, I was spending more and more time, um, you know, as the YouTube channel was growing and different things. And I sort of wanted it if possible, to become part of my actual role within the university. Um, because it was reaching a point where it was no longer a hobby. Like, uh, you know, it was taking up... I could still do my actual job because I was just teaching and I'd just say teach two days a week. And then maybe the other four days a week, I'm like working on Tom Rock's maths. So it was like, hmm, it would be great if this could actually be part of my job. And then, you know, I wouldn't... It would just be... Well, it'd just be ideal, to be honest. Unfortunately... Um, so Nedman Hall, Teddy Hall were like really open to that idea. And I'd already been teaching there for a year 
when we had these discussions and they just thought everything I was doing was amazing and they wanted it to be part of the the college outreach program and for the college to be more closely aligned with what I was doing and various other things so it just kind of all fit perfectly like I sort of wanted to have wanted it to be part of my position at the university they wanted to expand their outreach program and it just kind of we just perfectly met in the middle and we're like right this is what we're doing this is what's happening so I'm now in the second year um, of this job and it's great I love it just as much as I did on day one that's really nice. good to hear and speaking about your YouTube channel is this like we can come to the conclusion of the podcast episode um, where did the name Tom Rocks Maths come from like wh- 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 what is your inspiration who um, well, it's hilarious because my mum came up with it. Happy to admit, you know, give her the credit where it's due. So I, the idea was I wanted, it, it should get the point across about, you know, what the channel's about. So obviously I am the channel. So that's the Tom part. Obviously I'm doing maths. So that's the maths part. And then I wanted something else in there that emphasized that it was a bit fun. It was a bit different. There were kind of, and also brought in a little bit of my personality. So we were toying around with all kinds of, you know, word combinations, more or less based around Tom maths and a third word. That was pretty much, you know, that was kind of the, once I sat down and thought about this properly, that was more or less what came out of it. And there were loads of different potential words and nothing quite felt right. And then I just remember one day just getting a text. Obviously, I've been discussing this with my parents and, and, you know, friends, you know, because I've been asking for their input and different things. And then I just remember my mum texting me one day and being like, what about Tom Rock's maths? And as soon as I saw it, I was like, you just know. I was like, that's the one. That's it. That's it. You know, you're thinking about this for like a month at this point. And I was like, that is the one. Because it feels like, I think it sort of, um, it brings some of my personality, hopefully anyway, it brings some of my personality and style to to the idea and also it hopefully again doesn't say I'm going to be like teaching maths or lecturing maths which all sound a bit formal it's like I'm going to be like rocking it in the sense of I'm just gonna have a bit of fun I'm just gonna be like let's just do some maths it's gonna be fun everyone's gonna be smiling it's gonna be cool we're not gonna worry about all the details and stuff we're just gonna do some cool stuff and have some fun Uh, and I think yeah I I think I like it even more than when we first came up with it actually (laughs) as it's as it's become like yeah the more I use it the more I just think it just perfectly sums up sort of what I'm about and what I'm trying to do Okay, so another idea that can that Tom Rocks Maths like the the signature where you where you like literally strip a equation you um, you explain to an audience you un- make them understand like the equation itself uh, where you also like you stripping the equation but you also stripping like where did that idea come from like where did you gain that courage like confidence I wouldn't do that. But... <laughs> um... So that one, um, so the the program I worked for, or I worked on at the BBC was called Naked Science. So this was a podcast and radio show. And it's very good, actually. Naked Science is a very, very good podcast. And the idea there was we were stripping back science to the basics. But obviously being a podcast, being a radio show, you could have a bit of a laugh about joking that we were naked in the studio. Obviously, we never were. But like, be a bit weird, you know, with our guests and various other things. But, you know, you could kind of, and obviously lots of people did ask questions about that. And, you know, you'd see social media comments about it and different things. And it was just having a bit of a laugh with that concept. But then, you know, and I thought that was quite fun. Um, and then when I was thinking about what I was trying to do with with the Equation Strip series, right? So that was like, I think there's like nine or 10 of them. And the idea was to take famous equations people have heard of and literally strip them back, i.e. make them understandable, right? Very much like what the naked scientists are doing, stripping back science to make it understandable. I thought I'm going to do this with famous maths equations that look, you know, people have heard of Navier-Stokes or Maxwell's equations. They just look like a mess of like weird foreign symbols if you're not a mathematician. So let's actually explain to people what do they represent? What do these symbols mean? Um, And then, you know, so that was kind of tied into the whole naked scientists idea. And then I was like, well, if I'm going to do this, it's obviously going to be a video. Like I can't really just like joke about the the nakedness. Like I kind of have to do it. Um, so I was just like, right, fine. I'm just going to do it. I don't know. It, like it did take a little bit of courage to be like, let's just do it. Why not? I'm going to just, it'll be fun. Um, but I think it also importantly tied into the idea of like trying to have a bit of a laugh and trying to be, a, have a bit of fun with, with maths. So like, 
And then that, my favorite, possibly my favorite ever YouTube comment I've received is on the first Equation Strip video, the Navier Stokes one. And it's just someone saying, I, I think I'm, this is slightly paraphrasing, but it's something like, um, I never knew naked, no, I never knew shirtless math existed. And now this is all I want in my life. <laughs> And like, I think that just sums it up really nicely. Like, you know, it, it's not that it's needed or it's just kind of like, it's just ridiculous. Uh, and, and I'm hoping that that kind of comes across in the sense of like, you don't need to be very serious and you can actually can have fun with maths. It doesn't need to be this set of very rigorous rules that have to be followed. I mean, ultimately that's what maths is, but that can put a lot of people off. So I think with this idea, I was trying to emphasize, look, like you can't possibly take this serious. I'm literally stood here in my pants. Like, you know, just trying to show people that the maths can be done in a fun way and you can have fun with this subject. Yeah. And what is your parents' reaction to that? <laughs> they, they laughed, you know, I, I, there was at first, it was a few, um, sort of like, are you sure you want to do this? Like, you know, <laughs> this, this is going to be on the internet forever. I was like, yeah, I don't care. You know, like, Again, um, yeah, there, there was something that I, I can't, I've mentioned this before in, in other interviews and I can never remember who told me this, but it's really, really important bit of advice that I always really enjoyed, um, which was to say that when you're doing something like this, something creative and, and whatnot, if everyone likes what you're doing, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Because the point is you can't make everyone happy with what you're doing, right? Um, and that was something that was... Um, important in particular for me to to keep in mind when I started doing this because obviously there were a lot of negative comments and there still are but I think those people just don't get what I'm trying to get at and that's fine because you know that clearly then my channel and what I do isn't for them if they don't see it in this fun you know let's have a laugh kind of context that I'm trying to present yeah. um, so you know and the people that do hopefully then think you know then will enjoy the other kind of stuff that I'm doing yeah. and so I think it does serve as like a almost like a, I wouldn't say like a test but it's almost like a good measure of like whether people are gonna get the vibe and the kind of idea that I'm trying to give across here as to their reaction to the, to the equation strip series yes uh, and yeah I think you in the growth of your channel has been brilliant um you from getting I think 2020's uh, YouTube award creator on the rise and uh, congrats congratulations on that um I'm a Two years late, you could say. Well, maybe a year and so late. A year. Um, it was December. It was December twenty nine. Uh, December twenty twenty. That was ridiculous, though. I, I'm still. In, I still can't believe that I got that award. <laughs> it's got an email from YouTube, be like, "You're a creator of the uh, creator on the rise." I was like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> Thanks. This is awesome. This this can't be real. And then suddenly, I was on the homepage of like international YouTube. Uh, I had loads of my friends screenshotting and being like, "Why are you on my YouTube homepage? I'm not subscribed to you." <laughs> Because obviously that's the joke, right? When it's when you when your friend has a YouTube channel, you can't possibly subscribe to your friend's YouTube channel. Uh, and and I'm sure you got got some criticism um, from people on the internet, like you you're basically stripping down to your to your boxes. Um, how did you how did you respond to those those criticisms? Um, like I know you you mentioned like you can't please everybody. Um, and I think I'm paraphrasing here now. Steve Jobs also, I think it was Steve Jobs that also said that if, if I wanted to please everybody, I would have become an ice cream man or have sold ice cream to everybody. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, how did you deal with that criticism? Um, I mean, at, at first it was certainly more difficult than it is now, right? To sort of like, like now you just kind of brush it off a little bit because as I say, I think my mathematical mind can like reason like it's a very small proportion of a much larger overall positive, um, you know, feedback and audience and things. Um, but those first ones, again, I think the way I tried to like rationalize it was that, you know, if people didn't enjoy that, then they just, that's fine. Like, you know, again, it's not for everybody and I'm not trying to please everybody with what I'm doing with it. And if they don't see, you know, if they don't get what I'm doing with Equation Strip, then they're not generally going to get what I'm doing with my channel. So, you know, it, it's obviously, it is quite polarizing and, you know, that's fair enough. And I'm sure there are some people who probably enjoy all my other content apart from that, which is fair enough. But, you know, I think 
again, I think it's, I'm very glad I did it right at the beginning because I just think it was a really good way of signifying to like the online community, like, this is sort of, you know, how ridiculous and, and how much fun and how silly I'm going to get with this, right? Like, I'm literally stood here in my boxes teaching you maths just because why the hell not? And I think that was a good way of getting some of my personality across, but also like, you know, saying to people, this is the gap that I'm trying to fill in that like maths YouTube space. I'm not trying to be serious and I'm not trying to like lecture things in a very formal way. I'm just trying to have a bit of fun. Yeah, I've, I've been fortunate enough to have great maths teachers and I'd really influence teachers out there, students out there, please go check um, Tom Rocks Maths on YouTube, uh, Instagram, worthy content, and Twitter, um, worthy content out there. And to finish up, we've got some rapid fire questions, Dr. Crawford. Um, you can answer this in one, one sentence, one word, whatever you'd like. Um, All right. Uh, I just... normally talk a lot, so this might be quite tricky, but I will, I will try. Uh, yeah. The, the... <laughs> it's not a problem at all even if it's long um but first question tell me who are your three most influential people in your life and how they've impacted you that's a difficult question to answer in a sentence jesus um, parents 100 percent, just being really supportive of me and and um you know what i wanted to do and everything um definitely my parents um i'd probably say my um tutors at st john's so when I was an undergrad, um, my, my three tutors I had there, Charles Batty um, and Paul Todd in particular, and David Sturzak was the third. But in particular, Charles and Paul were both really good tutors and really got me hooked on maths, like the way they taught it and everything was was incredible. Um, and then would be my PhD supervisor, Paul Linden. Um, I I would credit him with turning me into the the person that I am today. I feel like I developed as a, as a human, really, during my PhD. Um, and obviously with him there guiding me and just being so cool and so laid back. Like, I, I can't even begin to describe how like awesome and cool this man is. Like he was, so some of my students when I was teaching them as a graduate student, I remember one day they said to me, who's your supervisor? And I was like, oh, it's Paul Lind. And they were like, is he the guy who's like 70 and rocks red jeans? And I was like, yeah. And they were like, ah, oh, yeah, he's cool. He's cool. So you know when like, you know, the 18 year olds are telling you that your supervisor's cool. Like he, he, he is, he's amazing. So I think those three parents, um, undergraduate tutors, and then my PhD supervisor, Paul. And next question, if you could go back to your 18 year old self, uh, one piece of advice, what would it be? Um, to care less about what people think. It took me again, when I say sort of, I became a human, became the person I am during my, my PhD. I think that was when I really reached the point where I was like, why why do i care what anyone else thinks about me or what i do like like i don't know like it, it's i think for me that happened during my phd so i think if i could go back and tell my 18 year old self like trust me this is the way to be this is the way to do it uh, would have been I, I got there but it would you know obviously getting there a bit earlier would have been i guess even better yes uh, i'm trying to get there now today myself i'm trying to practice it's it's tricky it's tricky and like and i don't think it just ha it doesn't just happen like that but like you know just trying to think back it for me it was during that during my phd period when i i really sort of like yeah be became the person i am yeah and that's brilliant at least uh, i think it's more important to find who you are than rather live to society's expectations yeah um, exactly and I, i'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to instill that in myself um slowly but surely it will come um next one would be if you could make a video a youtube video with any historical figure who would it be? um probably Only richard one. feynman because uh, it would just be endlessly entertaining and we'd probably be drunk <laughs> so yeah let's we'd okay we'd, we'd almost certainly be in like a bar i don't know doing some like weird experiment involving the fluids of alcohol uh with richard feynman yeah well you'd be playing the bongos also well, yeah, all that. Yeah, he'd be like playing. <laughs> you can teach me how to play the bongos. That would also be entertaining. Yes. Um, and yeah, what do you think the world would look like in five years? Oh, God. Um, well, I'm hopeful that um, we'll all be able to travel again without as much restriction. Obviously, slowly starting maybe to see that. But for me, the last two years, um, given that, you know, one of my favorite things is to travel. Um, I've mentioned this a few times with like the runs and the festivals and, you know, and I love doing talks and going to visit 
um you know schools and universities in other countries it's it's awesome it's like definitely probably my favorite perk of the job is being able and getting invitations to travel to these places to go and speak to the students um so i'm starting to do a few of those again later this year um but yeah so um that would be the main thing i'm hoping for beyond that i don't think i could possibly predict anything because <laughs> you know look back five years ago from now nobody said this would be happening um you know and there's just so many other things that were just unexpected so i'm not going to pretend to even attempt to predict anything except hopefully maths will be even more acceptable as a subject to enjoy people will no longer or fewer people will happily admit they don't like it uh, and yeah and hopefully as i said my sort of wish would be that we'll be able to travel will become as, as easy as it used to be pre COVID. Now I've been introduced to travel uh, from an early age. So I've got the travel bug as well. So, you know, you're not alone. I haven't been out of South Africa for a very long time. Uh, so I think I, I, I really want to travel again. So you are not alone there, Dr. Crawford. Um, and last question, my last one. And what is your, the most important lesson you've learned over your Probably career? the thing we've touched on quite a bit recently, the, the, the discussion about um, just, just being yourself and, and not caring about what, you know, you don't need to be what other people think you should be and, and you don't need to care about what other people think. Um, now, it's, I think perhaps it's easier for me to, to say this given that I can sort of like demonstrate my maths credentials and so therefore... Um, you know, the fact that I have tattoos and piercings and things obviously has no effect on my ability to do maths and I'm able to back up my ability to do maths. But, you know, that kind of um, is something I get asked about a lot from people is to say, you know, how is it being in academia and having like lots of visible tattoos and, you know, and like a lip ring and different things. And, you know, there are, I, I would be lying if I said there aren't some people who clearly you can just tell and it's like, give you a second look or, or and whatnot unfortunately you know those outdated opinions do still exist um but again like just you know this is me this is just me expressing who i am it has absolutely no um interference and no like uh, effect on my ability to teach maths and do maths um and i just think that sort of is like um you know such an important sort of like thing to to realize and to learn and just you know be true to yourself do what you enjoy be who you want to be and you know as long as like your passion and your ability in what you want to do will always shine over any other like opinions people might have formed of you thank you so much dr crawford for being on the podcast really appreciate your time as well as the knowledge you've shared with us you're welcome it's been great fun thanks for having me to our listeners out there thank you for listening Links to Tom Rock's Matt's content are in the show notes. If you enjoyed this podcast episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a five-star rating and review, or even subscribe to the channel. To catch all the latest from me, you can follow me on Instagram and on Twitter at expandable underscore mind. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>